If you're into social media, this guy is a god. He controls like 75 million people or something crazy like that. So please give a warm applause to Stephen Barlett from the Social Gym. That was a little bit over the top, that introduction. Um, okay, so social chain. I'm the, my name's Steve. I'm 23 as of last week. Um, I am the CEO and the co-founder of um, Social Chain, Europe's largest secret, not so secret anymore, influencer marketing agency. And I'm going to tell you our story, um, and hopefully it's a really fascinating one. Um, our company is uh, 11 months old now. We hire 50 people in the UK here in Manchester and London, um, and it's pretty awesome. So numbers. So we have 181 million followers in total uh, across Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We get over a billion impressions on just one of our communities every month. We have hundreds of them. Um, we started 34 national trends this month alone. We started 12 worldwide trends this month. Um, and so here's why we're not a secret. So a couple of months ago, BuzzFeed found out we existed, and they made us the number one article on buzzfeed.com and .co.uk. Um, the article says how social chain is secretly taking over Twitter. And in the same week, Vice, BBC Radio 1, BBC News, The Times, Forbes, The MEN, BBC Radio 4. This is me and the Sunday Times that week. Um, the production companies came down, so Fremantle came down and did a documentary on us. And then Burning Mark Productions came down to, to film a series about the social chain in our little business. Um, and when BuzzFeed came down, they came armed with this quote. This quote says, the kids that claim they can make anything the number one trend on Twitter in less than half an hour. And we don't go around selling trends. There's, for us, there's no inherent value in just a trend alone. But it was a challenge that BuzzFeed set us, so we accepted the challenge. And this is what it says in the article at the top of the article. It's a really, really long piece. It says, it takes 26 minutes for the staff at Social Chain to push this hashtag for the number one trend in the UK. Um, when it died down later, 40,000 people had tweeted about it. Okay, it's trending, Dom McGregor says nonchalantly, the 21-year-old co-founder doesn't seem particularly phased by the news. Dom's sat over there, Dom, just give it a wave. <laughs> Dom's my business partner. Um, okay, so uh, the secret group of kids that choose what all the other kids are talking about. So I spoke at a conference called Soccer X uh, a week and a half ago, and because it was our first time speaking to a, a sports audience, we wanted to generate our, we wanted to demonstrate the, the amount of influence we have within sport as well. So we, uh, we had a think about what we could do to, the night before the conference, and we looked at what's happened in the transfer window this year and how Arsenal are the only club that didn't sign an outfield player and how the, their fans have been trying to, trying to get the manager to spend his money. So we thought what we'll do is we'll make the, the fans' wish come true and we'll make Arsenal sign a player. So we needed a name. So we made an anagram of Soccer X called Rex Echo. Okay. Uh, here's Rex Echo, 16 years old. Uh, here's some stats about Rex Echo. Uh, he's, it takes him 606 minutes to score a goal. Uh, and you know the Arsenal fans wanted uh, Arsenal to spend, so we made him ridiculously expensive as well. He's 16, he's worth 34 million pounds, making him the most expensive player of his age of all time. And we pressed our magic social chain button, and then in a while started talking about Rex Echo. So we saw 10,000 10, tweets come in in the first hour. Here's some, shows what the narrative was like on Twitter. Um, there was three of us sat in the office. It was a bit of a joke. There was me, Dom, and a guy called Nick. It was about 9 o'clock at night. So some people were comparing it, saying he's better than uh, Benzema. He's going to be the next big thing in British football. And then, of course, it starts trending on Twitter within an hour of us talking about Rex Echo. It trends in at number, number nine. A lot of people talking. More tweets started to flood in. People, <laughs> this guy, Rex Echo's agent 16 and worth 34 million. I'm, I'm not even worth a text back. <laughs> and more tweets started flooding in. This guy in the bottom left says, man, no one has a clue about Rex Echo, but that's not necessarily true because this guy could have sworn he'd seen him play. <laughs> <laughs> and then it starts trending at number five on Twitter. This is an hour after we've made up Rex Echo as a person. And then it moves over to uh, Reddit as well, where people start to have conversations about Rex Echo. And was he, was he going to be good enough for Arsenal? Bree Sport laughed at Arsenal fans for signing 30, a 16 year old for 34 million. And then the Daily Star did a piece on Rex Echo as well. And obviously, the Daily Star looked into the story and realized that Rex Echo doesn't exist. They checked FIFA. They said there's no player under the name of Rex Echo. <laughs> they, they looked on social media. He'd never been mentioned ever up until an hour ago. So they started to do some fact checking and they discovered that Rex Echo was in fact, a, in fact a hoax. Then a couple of the other big sort of social media accounts started weighing in on it. Um, Unilad did a piece on him, which was really well shared, calling it fictitious. The Metro did a piece on Rex Echo as well. 
calling it a hoax. Bet365 laughed at people for believing it. And if you Google search Rex Echo as of this morning, this is what it looks like. You've got the Mirror, the Metro, the Daystar, all the big commentators, the Loud Bible, and so on and so on and so on. And that was just a bit of fun that we, we did. <laughs> so how did this all start? I moved to, to Manchester when I was 18 years old, and I was, I was studying business, and um, I had an idea. Um, my mum's African, as you can probably tell. One of my parents must be. Um, and, I, and I decided to drop out of university with, after one lecture. Um, anyone who has maybe an African mum, specifically a Nigerian one, knows how that went for me. <laughs> and this was my idea. It's called Wall Park. It's like a, a gum, gum shoe for students almost. It's like a, a student notice board. And I didn't have any money. Uh, I'd never built a website before. And I certainly didn't believe in traditional marketing, especially to target my demographic of young people. So I looked at other ways that we could reach young people. And the obvious one was social media. Um, and just at that, that time, Don McGregor, who sat over there, had run out of toilet paper in his halls of residence in Edinburgh. And when he did, did so, he, d he did the logical thing that we all do when we run out of toilet paper. He started a Twitter page about running out of toilet paper <laughs> and other student problems called student problems. Um, and at the time when I met him, the, the little icon on the page was a toilet roll, an empty toilet roll tube. And this page had 5,000 followers when I met him. And the day after it had 12,000, and then the day after it had 25,000. And I could see it going viral, and I could see my friends sharing it. So I sent him an email saying, hey, I've got some way you can make some money to meet me. I go up to, Edim uh, to York to meet him, and he drops out of university too. Um, <laughs> straight away, terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> and we, and we, we, we used that page, but we built virtually every student-related page on social media um, over the space of that summer with our little team. And when the, the algorithm was ripe on Facebook for creating pages, we could get a page from zero to 250,000 likes in an afternoon. We did that on a number of occasions. Um, and then in December 2013, I exited that company, and I went traveling around the world. I was a consultant for Bebo and Michael Birch in the Valley, and I was a consultant for a number of applications in London. Um, and we had these pages still. And Spotify approached us and said, hey, we know you've got these pages. Um, would you post about Spotify on, on your student pages that you've built? And so we said yes. We still didn't see it as a business. We saw it as a bunch of parody pages, a bunch of funny communities, whatever. Um, and then Tim, um, Just Eat approached us and said, hey, we've seen the work we've done with Spotify, because we did eight, eight different campaigns with Spotify. And they said, can we use your pages as well? We said yes. Again, we didn't see it as a business, didn't have a website, a logo, anything. It was just them contacting steve at gmail.com. But it wasn't until a guy in America contacted us called Gary Gallagher, who had made uh, this game called Tippy Tap until we sort of really realized what we had and the power of our business. He, he messaged us, he said he's got no money, he's built this game with his inheritance from his mum and his dad, um, and would we promote it? We obviously said no, because um, he was just a stranger to us. Um, but we sat in this restaurant in, uh, in Manchester, and we, we downloaded the game, um, and it was really addictive, and it was really good. And me and Dom hadn't, we sat in this restaurant in the Northern Quarter, we haven't spoke to each other in an hour, so we start to, to think, you know, maybe we should find some way to work with this game. I mean, Don proposed a revenue share, so I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. We sent him this contract on eSign, and he sends it back, it's 50-50 revenue share. So we're like, right, let's promote it. And um, Dom had a hypothesis. Dom said, you know, our, we, have, we own so many pages now across Twitter and Facebook that in order to get people to download this game, we no longer have to post a link to the App Store. In fact, we don't even have to say the game's good. We can tell people the game's terrible, it's addictive, don't download it, it'll ruin your life. But because that will come from so many different accounts, the biggest Harry Potter pages in the world, the biggest Friends pages, the biggest sports pages in the world, the biggest student pages in the world, all at the same time, you know, it, it might make people talk about it. So that's what we did. And from 75 pages that we owned at the time, we just talked about it. On our student pages, we said, don't download Tippy Tap, it'll, it'll, you'll, you'll, you'll get addicted, retweet to save a degree. Um, and things, things along that line. And um, we're sat in this restaurant, and Tippy Tap goes to the number one trend on Twitter. 40,000 people tweeted about it while we were sat there. And we'd, we'd, we'd never seen anything like it. We'd never promoted anything before of this nature. It did 100,000 downloads in the first eight hours, 40,000 people talked in the first five hours, went to number one in the App Store, the overall App Store, where it stayed for 14 consecutive days, uh, made hundreds of thousands in revenue in the first month, made even more in the second month. BBC News talked about it the day after. Um, and you can imagine, it was, it was a huge shock to us as well. But then our perspective on what we had started to change. So we no longer viewed our, our uh, social media accounts as a bunch of parody pages. We started to see them as like miniature magazines, right? So the Harry Potter page has 400,000 followers. We see that as, a, as like, imagine it as like a magazine that produces funny Harry Potter related content and that has 400,000 subscribers to it. 
So uh, we went around the, the country and rounded up virtually everyone we could who built a huge social media asset in their bedroom. And there's these kids all across the country and all across the world who have 20 million, 10 million, 5 million followers, and they built them in their bedroom for fun, right? So good example is Connor. We met Connor when he was 19, about three years ago. Um, no, about two years ago now. And then when we started the social chain, we, we went and acquired him and his, and his assets. And Connor had started a number of pages. I couldn't fit them all on here. He's, he runs Love Food, for example, which is the biggest food page on the planet. It's got 5.1 million followers as of today. When he posts a picture of a pizza, it gets 200,000 likes on Instagram. And if he posts, posts a burger or an ice cream, it gets 5,000 to 15,000 comments virtually instantaneously. It's super, super engaged. The same kind of engagement as like a Kim Kardashian post or something. His fitness page as well is the biggest fitness page in this country. It's got 1.7 million followers. Um, and he runs a bunch of other pages, um, 17 in total. And when I met Connor, he, he said to me, he said, I'm come, I came to this meeting because I owe my mum 30 quid and I don't get pocket money anymore. And I'm like, Connor, you've got 17 million followers. Because he'd been posting Nike shoes on his fitness pages, right? So I presumed he had a deal with Nike. Every, virtually every other post was Nike. But when I met him, he was like, no, that's just what people join the page to see. And it really, really baffled me, but it wasn't just Connor. Um, another example, oh, sugar. Break it click a thing. Hannah. So Hannah was also a primary school teacher when we met her. She had started the Sims page because she's a huge fan of Sims, and then she'd use this page to start the Harry Potter page here. And this one had blown up when J.K. Rowling retweeted it and followed it. If you go on J.K. Rowling's timeline as of right now, the last tweet is actually this this page, and she's got five six million followers. So this page had blown up as well. And when we met her, she had just started this page called Primary School Problems. She was working in a primary school on the playground and she was tweeting nostalgic things that are still relevant today from all of our childhoods. And this page got this huge celebrity following and it was, was blowing up. And at the time, that was our fastest growing page. And she started so many other pages. She's also started a bunch of pages that never worked, right? But you'd never see those because she can put six tweets out, amplify that across our network. If it doesn't work, she just tries something else. So another example, you probably, a lot of you probably know Medieval Reactions. Put your hand up if you know Medieval Reactions. Okay, quite, quite a few of you, cool. So this is ultimately the reason why BuzzFeed came down and Vice and, and all those guys found out we existed. This page went from zero to 315,000 followers in 115 tweets. So some of the tweets on here have 40,000 retweets. It was this hugely hilarious page, so much so that it's actually spray painted onto our walls in the office. Fastest growing page of all time that we've had. Um, and it was this huge phenomenon. And when they looked at um, this page, Vice, they, went on, they saw in the bio that it says, uh, inquiries, contact Cahill. They met Cahill. Cahill was like, I don't own these pages. Social Chain does. And so they said, what's Social Chain? And then and that's when all the PR came from for Social Chain. Moving on. OK, so then we went round and we, we uh, signed in a lot of celebrities as well. We looked at celebrities who might not necessarily be so hot right now. Frankie was the first celebrity we signed. He has 2 million followers, but he had no commercial opportunities. And he won't mind me saying this, but at the time, he was sleeping on his friend's sofa in his friend's house. And he didn't have any sort of revenue or anything like that. So he said to us, he said, I've got 2 million followers. Is there anything I can do to, to, to monetize my audience? Fashion influencers, we hired three of the most influential fashion Insta celebrity girls we could in, in the UK, Georgia, Thea, and Hannah. And they went rounds and rounds with all their friends. And we've done campaigns with ASOS and Metcalfs and Walkers and major brands surrounding um, their, their Instagram channels. YouTubers as well, so um, early on we hired a guy called Nick, who was one of the big YouTubers in the UK, and he rounded up uh, as many hot young YouTubers as, as we could. We signed all these guys exclusively, and many more, and we've done a number of campaigns with them. We don't just do videos uh, with, with these guys, we do, uh, we work, one of our big clients is Fox, so we've done a lot of um, movie releases with these guys, where we'll put them on a tour bus, send them around the country, we'll make it trend for seven days in a row, then Snapchat will feature it because we've caused so much hype. Trying to skip through this, that's kind of sports influencers. So we, we hired Nick, uh, who had made BBC Sport, which many of you may know, because it's, one, it's the biggest sort of sports account out there that's grown organically um, in, in this country. It's bigger than Sports Bible in terms of its organic growth. So we hired Nick, who had made BBC Sport. We created a lot of these assets ourselves, and the ones we didn't create, we went and met the people who created them, and we've got agreements in place with those guys. So there's hundreds of sports accounts as well, and this is how we did the Rex Echo thing at the end of the day. And out, of all, and out of this network, the social chain was born. As I said, we're, as a company, we're 11 months old now. Um, and you'll learn a bit more about us. So these are some of our clients. We work with the big agencies in London as well. So Universal, McCann, Zenith, and those guys. Um, E1 as well, who released all the big movies and stuff. 
Um, a good example of a campaign we've done recently with E1 for the release of Sinister 2, we made a trend for 11 consecutive hours after we pressed our launch button. 60,000 people tweeted about it in the first night. Some of the numbers, we did uh, just short shy of a million views on the trailer in the first night. Uh, 75 million impressions on Sinister 2. And in broadcast and TV, we work a lot with Comedy Central so on their releases. Here's an email from the guy at Comedy Central, their head of marketing, says that we broke all their records since the golden years of Two and a Half Men. You'd have to go back till the, the years of Two and a Half Men to beat those numbers. Um, an overview of the social chain, over 50 of us, 22 years old is the average age. I'm actually one of the older ones, believe it or not. Um, We've raised major investments to accelerate our growth. We're, we're now 11 months old. This is a look at our office. We've got a big slide. Um, it goes into a ball pool. We've got two puppies, which are uh, permanent at Social Chain. Um, here's a picture of some of the team. It's half the team in Manchester. We're upstairs, we've got a, it's all, it's all a ma one big mattress room, so you can go up there and play video games and stuff. And yeah, that's the Social Chain. I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hey. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, really quite inspiring. And I should say I've got an idea of mother as well. So oh, you guys, yeah. <laughs> when you said you were going to university, when yeah. I went to course, she had my mum. We call now, by the way, me and my mum. We didn't speak for two years. <laughs> two yeah, she, she's, she, when I said she, she literally like disowned, disowned me, but we're really good now, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pay a couple of them bills off, and yeah. Well, not that. Um, <laughs> So the question is, if you're going to start from zero, from the, the brand new Twitter page, without the influence that you had, yeah. how would you set about getting to 10,000 Twitter followers, 100,000, and you know, magnitudes of Twitter? If you didn't have the influence that you have already with the, the network sites. Sure. Right. So if you were starting from scratch, um, I, remember, I remember Dom, because I asked Dom, I said, when you started your first page, like how, how did you how did you um, blow up to those big numbers? And he told me a number of things. He, he'd done 400 tweets before he hit 400 followers. So there's an element of like resilience and sticking at it. Um, one really good way to, to blow up a page from scratch is to, to ride on the back of trends, right? So this whole thing right now with David Cameron and this pig, you know, if you can create content around big trends and or create great content around those trends, you'll benefit, your community will benefit and it will grow. Um, and there's, there is also an element of luck, right? And that can't be dismissed. It's, it's, it's timing, it's um, great content, and it's knowing how to, to ride those trends and therefore benefit. Hope that, hope that helps. Do I have any other things out there? Dom and those guys would be even better answering that question. Maybe you should come up, Dom. Uh, hi, Steve. Thanks very much. Um, great talk. Now, uh, your reactions has like 33 accounts yes. with the same um, yeah. you know, icon, yeah. and many of them with dozens of thousands of followers. Yeah. How does it work? What's the, what's so, the so whenever, in this Twitter space, whenever you have a success, it will be replicated 30, 40, 50 times. So medieval reactions is the biggest one. And, if, and it's the, it was the first one and the biggest one, okay? And then any, any of our accounts, you search any of our accounts, there'll be 20, 30, 40 of them. What happens is people who have an account right now with maybe 200,000 followers, which isn't super hot, they'll change the name, they'll change the display picture, they'll change the, the header. And that's something that we've seen. Medieval Reactions is the one that got all the credit and all the press because that was the first one. But with primary school problems, with our Hogwarts page, the Hogwarts page Hannah made in her bedroom because she's just this, she's got a Harry Potter title on her wrist. She's, she's the, she cried yesterday when J.K. Rowling tweeted her. But her page has been copied 20, 30 times. The content is copied every single day. If she does a tweet right now, I can show you on the tweet deck live, it being copied around the world. We've got to a point where we're, to be honest, we're numb to it now. We don't chase those people, we don't complain about it, because we understand that this is the space we're operating in. But yeah, hopefully that answers the question. And even the BBC Sports account that Nick made, that's, you, if you search that, there'll be 10 of them as well, but they'll all be smaller. There's a lot of communities that are in groups in groups, pages, and what uh, are you working with people that have massive um, um, groups on Facebook as well? Specifically Facebook groups? Yeah, or other, like uh, Reddit, Facebook, or... Yeah, I mean, we work with, um, we work with a number of different um, community owners. We work with the Lab Bible a lot, who everyone probably knows. Um, we work with a lot of big Facebook pages, and we work with a lot of people who have big media websites, so people that write articles, because Sometimes with our campaigns, we'll need um, someone to host an article for us so that we can amplify it. 
or um, if we're doing a campaign with a, a big brand like Pepsi or something surrounding sport, we'll want to go and seek out more influencers, um, and more Facebook pages and more Facebook groups that have a big sort of niche uh, following of, of that, that, that that category. So yeah, we work, don't just work with our own assets, we work with virtually anybody who owns a big community. Yeah. So you work with a family of pages? Yeah, so um, her question was... 75 pages. So we own, we own a, a just short shy of 300 pages ourselves. With that same, we own. With the same logo? No, 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 they're all uh, different topics. Um, and so we, we own those and we have 30, 32 people who run those pages who are either full-time or they're too young to be full-time so they're still in school. Um, yeah, they come back in summer, they come and work at Social Chain full-time and they go back to school. But they'll, when they leave school, they'll all come and be full-time. You say you hire influencers, you, you pay them to tweet or to... Yeah, so um, she asked, do we pay influencers to tweet? That's probably about, t uh, about 5 10% of, of the campaigns we do. We, um, we tend to use, because we're like a media owner ourselves, we tend to use that, the communities that we own first, but then there are some instances where we have to go out and find people because we don't have enough reach in that area, because it's a niche area, so yeah. yeah. Shall I follow the microphone? Where's the microphone? Yeah, oh. um, so, you seem like a nice guy. You guys seem to be having lots of fun, and you seem to have a hell of a lot of power. How do you, with your team, um, hold yourselves accountable? Because if you're making money off big brands, what's stopping you from doing something that could turn out to be irresponsible? We're, yeah, no, we, no, there's no one in our business that would let that happen. And if that, if that was ever suggested for us to do anything that was underhand, it would, I, would, I would know that the people we have at our business... For example, someone one day suggested working with Dapper Laughs, right? And, he, and the, whoever suggested that, they're going to ruin the day they said that. Because they, the guys at our business, like Hannah and those guys, have such a high moral compass that... If we won't talk about stories like we didn't, we won't talk about anything related to Ebola, for example. Like although you can you can write content about it, we won't talk about anything which is remotely like risque on any of our channels. We won't talk about diseases. We won't talk about suffering. We won't talk about people being alleged allegedly committed of crimes. We actually didn't even talk about the David Cameron thing because we don't think that's like a responsible thing to talk about. And fortunately, the, our content director who is in charge of all of our communities, Hannah, she has the highest moral compass, so she won't let anybody talk about anything that's like remotely we won't we've been asked to get involved in a lot of political um campaigns as well you know do a campaign to make this candidate look better we won't do anything like that either well, we won't do fox. drugs we won't do well, alcohol fox. sorry to interrupt. fox yeah was owned by murdoch so fox, fox, fox movies yeah so by murdoch uh, well i i don't i don't know yeah, anyway, I'm just saying yeah, yeah yeah from our perspective yeah. we work with fox because they're a movie company yeah, we don't no, do yeah, yeah, yeah. the ultimate owner of yeah, so we're, we, we've got no problem promoting movies. That's, for us, that's not like a, a moral infringement, so, yeah, yeah. Well, hi, Peter. Um, given all of this buzz is amazingly well with the student demographic and library from entertainment, mm -hmm. can this be replicated in a more corporate, boring space? And is the demographic you've got an audience for receptive to anything more corporate, or could you sell something not just in the yeah, I mean, we, we, we're really protective over our audiences. So we, um, we say no a lot more than we say yes to opportunities. So we know that our audience is really the, the youth market in Europe and the, UK, and the UK. So we virtually only ever talk about things which are relevant to that audience. So we've had like opportunities to talk about like banking and those kind of things. And we would we'd never do that because it's not something that our audience would appreciate anyway. So with movies, we were posting movie trailers before the social chain. Because that's, people genuinely picked those up and retweeted those. And um, what's another good example? TV shows. We talk, we talk about TV shows anyway. We've been talking about Towie on our network and Made in Chelsea and those shows. So we're happy to talk about those in, in that way as well. So, yeah. Could you replicate this for a different demographic audience? Yeah, we could, yeah. Um, you've, got to, you've got to ask the question, um, does that demographic use social, social media enough for the community to exist? But if they do, then, then yeah, you can. Um, we probably wouldn't be the ones to do that because we're probably too young. But um, so we wouldn't know like what to say. But uh, yeah, it could definitely be done. Oh, sorry. Hey. Um, so on your screenshots, I mean, so Twitter and Instagram. But what's your approach on Facebook, and how yeah. easy it, it is to grow a viral page, a Facebook page at this day and age? Of yeah. Do you know what? We just don't grow Facebook pages anymore because the algorithm changed and they made it really, really ripe for 
articles and video, right? Back when we started, the reason we could grow these pages so big is because when you liked the page, it would tell all your friends you liked it. So there was a viral loop there. That's all gone now. I, I wouldn't even try, me personally, try, try to grow a Facebook page of the type that we have um, anymore. That's just me personally. However, my friends' Facebook pages are growing rapidly because they've now focused their content around video, native video on, on Facebook and, and articles and things like that. Yeah. Sorry, next thought. Um, are you tempted to become the media owner as well? So you talk about like BBC Sport, but are you tempted to turn each of those social brands into their own destination site slash apps, or do you not think that the value is there anymore in the actual site? Um, it's, it's possible, but we've, we've always stayed away from that. And um, everyone else in this space that owns big communities, the majority of them, have opted to do that. They've, they've opted to say, we've got student problems, it's got 200,000 followers. Everyone else started a website called Student Problems and then directed traffic there and then benefited from the, the, the banner ads. We chose that we didn't want to do that. Um, very early on, we decided we didn't particularly want to post links to anything on our, on our pages. We kind of just wanted to talk about things. Um, and so we chose not to. And I don't think we'll, 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 we'll change that decision because it's, it's, it's gone really well for us. So, so um, I was wondering is there growth in Facebook ads? on all your channels only based on the content? Or do you use any other technique? Yeah, so um, we, it's the content, and we know how to, to, to post content at the right time to, to really, really benefit in terms of growth. So we know, for example, in the World Cup, we were the number one trend worldwide for the World Cup because we, we saw that Brazil had just let in, I think it was like five or seven goals or something ridiculous. So all of our pages at once created this hashtag um, which we knew that would become the number one trend, and then when you click on that hashtag, it will be all of our pages. So anyone in the world would then see all of, meet all of our pages. So we know that if we get all of our pages to talk about a certain hashtag at once, that will trend, which means that when anyone clicks on it, you'll see all of our pages, which means that they'll all gain thousands of followers. Things like that, and know how like that is like, it's almost like, uh, goes without saying in the social chain. Like the guys that work there know these things and we've never written it down. on how, how do you do things to grow pages? Obviously, the other way we grow our pages is by just, you know, if, if a piece of content has worked really well on, say, this sports page, we can amplify that across 300 pages. Uh, you know, so if it's hot, we can, we can show it to more people. Yeah. Um, you talked about kind of rounding up people to promote things. So you were saying you found a great YouTuber who rounded up 60 other YouTubers. But um, when, when you're talking about that, are you talking about bringing them on board in a kind of know, we'll help you grow your community if you help us boost our content? Yeah, or so, is there a kind of revenue share? What, how do you yeah, so with, um, with our YouTubers, we've signed all of them, so we manage them as people as well. So when they make a lot of money, we give them financial advisors. One of our YouTubers made a fortune off of merchandise sales, so we gave him a legal advice and a financial advisor. We send them to premieres. This week, all of our YouTubers have gone to the, the Pan premiere for Peter Pan. Um, we'll advise them on commercial opportunities. We handle all of their emails. So anyone that inquires with Adam Wade for any of our YouTubers comes through to our team, comes through to Nick's team at Social Chain. Um, and, then there's, and then we'll also give them commercial opportunity offers. So we'll say, Coca-Cola want you to do a video where you, you, know, you open a Coke with a, when you shoe or something. Do you want to do it, yes or no? So it's like a full managed talent management service. There's time for one more short question. Hi, uh, Megan, just people who have so many Instagram accounts, What's the practicality of doing it? Because I've got two of the Instagram accounts, it's actually a pain in the arse. Yeah, it's really hard. Tips and tricks for... Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like one of the hardest platforms because you have to just keep signing in again, don't yeah. you? And with all these other platforms, everyone's created like OpenAPI where you can just, you can be, we're logged into 300 Twitter accounts at once. Or on Instagram, like Connor, for example, who runs like a lot of the Instagram accounts, has to just keep signing in and out. And Buy more Android phones. Yeah, buy more phones. That's like yeah, that's an expensive solution, but I won't. Android's cheaper. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, cheap. Cool. Okay, give it up to Stephen Barton. Thank you so much.